again everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are going to be taking a look at the newly released Azure Poly Transal C160. The C160 was a collaborative effort between both France and Germany with the aircraft being designed to meet the requirements of their respective air forces. The Transal has now been all but retired but Azure Poly choosing to bring the aircraft back to life within the sim and hopefully we're going to see the C-160 brought back in exacting detail as Azure Poly had access to the real-world aircraft courtesy of the European Aviation Museum. I've been pretty impressed with Azure Poly's previous efforts to date so quite interested to see what we find here with the Transal. For our flight today we're going to be running a humanitarian mission. We're currently on the ground in Entebbe. We're going to be taking the aircraft up north towards Juba in South Sudan. As always I do hope you enjoy the video. The Transal certainly offers something a little bit different, it's a big old military turboprop. The aircraft really designed to be operated by a four man crew. So hopefully it's going to give us some fun on our flights today. Let's head for the cockpit and we'll start running through our checks. So today we find ourselves in the cockpit of the Transal C160. We're currently on the southerly end of the apron here on the ground in Entebbe. Obviously we've just boarded the aircraft and so far all we've done got the battery masters selected on. That's allowed us to start up the APU and we now have the APU generator selected on the bus. We've also got the transfer switches selected on and that's allowing us to spy the entire aircraft electrical network. In terms of our before start checks then, firstly checking the fuel valves. We've got eight of those. Leftmost valve I believe is for the APU. We've then got three for each of the main tanks and on the right there we've got the fuel dump valve that's set closed. Once again the battery masters are selected on, the battery voltages have been checked. For the fire detection system we've already carried out an APU fire test so we'll just run the engine fire tests. Firstly on the left, cancelling the master warning there. And same on the right, again cancelling the master warning. The nav lights are set on, anti-collision light is selected on. Fuel burn indicators, according to the checklist we want to reset those but I'd prefer not to do so here today. I found previously resetting the fuel burn calculators does tend to render them inoperative thereafter. So we'll leave those as is. Once again we've already started up the APU so the APU inlet is selected open. Red system hydraulic pressure is checked. Generator 5 is once again on the bus. The engine vibration monitors can go on. And we can align the IRSs, so both IRS 1 and IRS 2. According to the manual, the modelling of the IRSs is pretty simplistic overall. For the trims, just checking the correct operation of both the elevator trim. We'll set two units up, I find that's a pretty good trim setting for the takeoff. And same as well for the aileron trim. Seem to need a lot of aileron trim in the transal initially during the takeoff. I find about three units out to the right tends to do the trick for the takeoff. You do have to wind that back later on as you come back off the power. So trims are set, flight controls, we have full up, pull down and neutral, pull left, pull right and neutral and on the rudders full left, pull right and neutral so flight controls are full and free. Altimeters, QNH today is 1026. So that's set there on the left, showing about 3,800 feet aerodrome elevation, which is correct. And we'll just set the right altimeter as well. And just dialing that back slightly. Altimeters are set. Fuel quantities, a little bit tricky to read here, probably even more so in the video. There's actually two needles on each of the gauges, so we've got about four tons of fuel there on the left, four tons on the right and same there in the centre. So we've got about 12 tons of fuel on board the aircraft in total. The water methanol quantity buried away on the overhead panel showing 100%. We're not going to need that however for the takeoff this morning. Fuel pumps. We've got two banks of fuel pumps, four on each side, selecting all of those on for the start. So fuel pumps are on. Fuel pressure is checked. Air conditioning bleed valves. We've got the engine bleed valve selected off, we'll take the APU bleed valve off there as well for the start. Prop sink is off and caged, same here for the prop brakes. Power levers are in the idle position, condition levers are in the cutoff position, idle levers, 
can go through to the start position. Ahead of the start, checking the doors are closed. Lights out, so the doors are closed. APU bleed air is selected on the general engine starts, which actually goes through to the lower position for the start, which seems a little bit counterintuitive to me, but nevertheless, set through to the start position. Part brake is set closed, checking the prop area. We'll have the chap there on the right, check the right prop. And it looks as though we're all clear there on the left. We'll start the left engine first, so uncaging the starter. Setting that through to run, we do have a start light. And coming back up to the overhead panel, we're looking at the low pressure spool tachometer initially, coming up through 2000 RPM before we introduce the fuel. And there's our 2000, so the left condition lever can go through to the low idle position. It can be a little bit tricky to get it into the correct detent sometimes. Okay, so set through to low idle. And you can hear there, we do have a good light off on the engine. Showing fuel flow, temperature coming up. Already up through 3,500 RPM. So the idle lever can go back through to the normal position there on the left. And just waiting here for the left engine to stabilise. Start lights out. So we'll cage up the starter once again. Pretty nice start sounds overall, I really like the engine sounds, they do sound pretty true to life there. I find though they're a mixed bag, they're very good on the ground, reasonable in the cruise, not so great on the takeoff overall. We'll do the same then on the right engine. There's our start lights. And I'm watching that tachometer till we come up through 2000 RPM. So as I was saying, the engine sounds are a little bit of a mixed bag, you'll obviously hear more of those as we go. But certainly during the start sequence, I think they're rather nice overall. Okay, condition lever set through to low idle. And just wait until we see 3,500 RPM. Which we now have, and again the idle lever there can go back through to the normal position. So just waiting on that number 2 to stabilise. Start light is out. So again, we'll deselect the starter, cage that up. The start master can go back to the off position. And for the off start checks, start master is selected off. Generators can now come online. So selecting generator 1, 2, 3, and four. Now we've got the generators on the bus, we can take the APU generator off. And the transfer switches there as well can go off. We're not going to need the APU for the rest of the flight, so we'll select that off as well. And the APU air inlet can go to the closed position. So generators are set, we'll test the spoilers. There we're just looking for the aero message on the EADI. So spoiler operation is correct, and closing those up once again, the error message is extinguished. Trims are once again set for the takeoff. Hydraulic pressures are checked. Taxi light can go on, though we're not going to commence the taxi just yet. Before we move, we'll set up the instruments, the avionics, and the FMS. So EADI is set as required. No bugs we're able to set currently, indeed as well it looks as though we can't set the pitch index there. For the EHSI, we'll set the top right there through to ground speed. Unfortunately quite a few of the functionalities in the mode is not currently working on the EHSI. That is noted in the manual, apparently they will be added at a later date. So for now setting the uh, course outbound from Entebbe, that's 349. The click spots as well are rather fiddly for both the course bars and the heading bug. So there's 349 selected for the course. And we'll leave the heading bug till we're out at the runway. Our temperatures look good. We'll initialise here both of our FMSs. They'll just run through a quick self-test sequence. The functionality as well with the FMSs is pretty basic at the moment. We'll just run through that very briefly. And the weather radar can go through to the standby position. 
So in terms of the FMS currently, not much we can do there really. Apparently at a later date you should be able to program in a flight plan. For now though, really it's just the comp page and the nav page that we're interested in. The NWVOR 117.5, so we'll tune that up. Soft, we're up to get down, uh, one, six, and we can transfer that across. Later on, Juba is 1131. So we'll set that in the standby. And Nav 2 we can tune up as well. We'll just go with the same sequence there for now. 1175 5 and 1131. Still looking good there in terms of our nav radios. That's pretty much it in terms of the setup. We just need to taxi our way out towards the runway. The wind's out from the north today, so we'll make our way out towards runway 35. And once we're down at the holding point, we can run through the before takeoff and the lineup checks. Good morning, uh, uh, we are on era. One six eight station Kigali requesting flight level three eight zero on board one five six diagonal seven station Echo Tango Alpha Papa Kilo Bravo seven three eight request uh, start up and push back. Okay, so we are now down at the holding point for runway three five. We can run through the before takeoff checks. Once again, APU not required for the takeoff this morning, so that's selected off. The yellow system hydraulic pump can go through to auto. Confirming that the fuel dump valve selected closed. Fuel pressures are checked. For the flaps, there didn't really seem to be any guidance in the manual for the flap position for the takeoff, so we'll just come through to 20 degrees. So flaps 20 selected and indicated. Flight controls. Once again, just confirming those are full free and in the correct sense. Doors are confirmed closed, condition levers can go through to the high idle detent. And I'd recommend using a keybind there if you can. I found sometimes when clicking on the particularly the right condition lever it seems to briefly bring itself back into the cutoff position. So condition levers are set to high idle, landing lights can go on, taxi light off, water methanol not required for the takeoff this morning, Peter heats can go on, same there for the AOA heat. And for the window heats, we'll go through to low and side window heat on there as well. Lastly, just confirming once again, we do have all eight fuel pumps selected. No master warnings, no cautions, and carrying out lights test. Everything looking good. So all set and ready to go, part brake can come off. Quick check out to the left, we look to be clear on final. And just coming up on the power levers, get the aircraft rolling. Overall, the taxi behaviour of the C160 is actually quite nice. It does pick up some speed, even back at idle power. Even with the condition levers back in low idle as well. And the acceleration rate is reasonable. Just have to periodically apply the brakes to keep the aircraft speed in check. The same goes for the nose wheel steering, that's pretty decent as well. So the aircraft quite nice to taxi overall. For the takeoff, we're looking for full power according to the manual. And the manual states rotate is at 70 knots, which certainly at this sort of weight doesn't seem to be appropriate. Our VREF at our current weight is around 113 knots. So I think there's a little bit of an error there, or well, that may be the rotate speed at empty weight, but it still seems rather low. Anyway, nicely lined up with the runway, heading looks good, coming up on the power levers. And you'll hear what I mean about those sounds, a little bit underwhelming unfortunately at takeoff power settings. Airspeed's alive, power is set. Just as a demonstration, coming back on the yoke here at 80 knots. And you can see really no elevator authority, the nose not interested in coming up, so again I think that VREF's slightly off. There's 100 knots. Directional control feels pretty decent, easy enough to keep the aircraft tracking down the runway. 110 now, so VR, easing back on the yoke. And certainly the behaviour there feeling much more reasonable overall. We'll pitch for 15 degrees nose up initially. That should have us climbing away around 110 knots. We do have positive climb, so the gear can come up.
we'll just maintain runway heading for now, keeping our climb speed to up through 500 feet. And there's 500, so we'll come back to our climb power setting. Again, no real detail in the manual with regards to power settings here, so we'll just go for 600 psi. And power is set. Speed's checked, we'll go to flaps 10. Uh, Ethiopian uh, 177, we have uh, traffic 11 o'clock. And we'll go flaps up. And again, going for that 15 degrees pitch up, maintaining the speed. We'll keep around 120 for now. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as though we can currently set the pitch index there on the EADI. So overall, the C160 actually flies quite nicely, so long as you do have it trimmed correctly. Again, we've got quite a bit of aileron trim in there currently, and the aircraft pretty pleasant to hand fly overall. Otherwise, though, you definitely have a pretty strong wing down tendency without the trim. Performing very nicely as well. We're doing 130 knots now here in the climb, about 3,000 feet per minute rate of climb, which does seem rather on the high side. We're up at around, I believe, 45 tonnes. And max takeoff weight, I think, around 51. So the performance there seems perhaps a little bit generous overall. Tracking away from the station now, 3.5 miles from Entebbe, up through 7,000 feet. We're climbing up to 10 today. And just leaving the shores of Lake Victoria behind us. We'll hold the after takeoff checklist until we've got the aircraft established here in the cruise. We can get the autopilot in and free up a little bit of workload for ourselves. One thing I have noticed coming out of Entebbe, the CDI bar seems to flick straight through the index. There's no nuance there as it comes through the scale. I don't know whether or not that's an issue with the Entebbe VOR or whether or not it's an issue with tracking outbound on the radial. It's certainly a little bit unusual there. And I haven't had the same issues tracking inbound on a radial, so again, I'm not entirely sure what's causing that. Keep an eye on the CDI bar here as we track outbound, you may notice the same behaviour again. We'll just come slightly left on the heading, looks as though we are out to the right of our track currently. But still pretty close into the station. There's 9,000 feet, so one to go. Worth noting as well here, the fuel burn gauges, once again, not reading correctly. Or rather, the fuel used gauges. So 500 feet, we'll start reducing that rate of climb. And we'll keep the current power setting till we're up to around 210 knots and then we can start reducing back towards our cruise power setting. Again, just adjusting that heading slightly out to the left. And as I say, with the trim in, the C160, quite easy to hand fly overall, fairly pleasant. Fairly weighty on the controls in roll, not so much in pitch. Still not bad in pitch though. Okay, it's 10,000 feet getting ourselves trimmed off. We can start reducing as well that aileron trim now that we're building up some speed and we'll be coming back off the power again shortly. So just continuing to feed in that elevator trim, getting ourselves leveled off. There's 200 knots now on the speed. And 210, so we'll come back to cruise power. Again, nothing mentioned in the manual there that I could see, so just going off some real world videos. It looks to be around 400 psi, a fairly typical cruise power setting. And again, just reducing that aileron trim back towards neutral now. So power is set, aircraft nicely trimmed out here. Once again, that CDR bar has gone straight through. We'll get the autopilot in and then we can investigate that a little bit further. So for the outs, we'll go to out cell and 10,000 feet. We'll hit enter. So altitude is selected, the autopilot or the AFCS can go on. We can center up the heading bug there as well. And we'll come into heading select, so we have heading select and out. And we'll just slew the heading round there. Again, we'll try and regain our track and we'll keep an eye on the CDI bar. 
The click spot for the heading select again, very fiddly overall, which is a bit of a shame. It's quite tricky to use. And that's even with track IR, so I imagine without it would be almost unusable at certain points. Overall, the autopilot on the aircraft does a pretty nice job. Keeping us level there at 10,000 feet, it'll track the heading, no issues. One downside of the Transall currently, I would say, is that you're pretty limited in terms of navigation options. With the FMS not really working correctly, pretty much just limited to uh, headings and flying off VORs as well. Looks as though we do have a uh, nav mode there, at the very least. Anyway, established now, we'll run through that after takeoff checklist. So flaps are up, gear is up, anti-ice system's not required, fuel pumps are set as required. Landing lights can go off, water methanol pumps are off, and for the air conditioning bleed valves, they are set open. That's the after takeoff checklist complete. Lastly, now that we're established in the cruise, we can set the prop sync on. And again, we've just gone straight through that CDI bar, so there's definitely a little bit of an issue there. Again, I don't know whether or not that's specific to the Entebbe VOR, or whether or not that's just a function of tracking outbound on a radial. I do seem to recall there was a product previously that had an issue exactly the same tracking outbound on radials with the CDI bar. I'm sure that Azure Poly will get that fixed up in pretty short order. So for now we'll just maintain heading, we're roughly on the right course anyway, and 21 miles out now from the station. On this particular flight there's actually not a whole lot in terms of scenery, you can see pretty flat running, there's a little bit of high ground as we approach Juba. Pretty barren, pretty sparse as well in terms of any infrastructure. I think we'll call it there though for the climb. Indeed now we are in the cruise, so as usual we'll head outside, take more of a look at the external model of the aircraft. I'll keep you updated on that CDI bar, and we can assess the situation again as we make the approach in towards Juba. So welcome back to the flight deck. We're just approaching our top descent point in towards Juba. We've got about 28 miles to run direct to the station. Interestingly, the CDI bar is actually now working correctly, so either there was an issue there with the Entebbe VOR, or I suspect more likely there's an issue with tracking outbound on a radial, but nevertheless it's working now in the correct sense. So for the approach here, we're going to loosely fly the VOR approach inbound towards Juba. Mostly of course today though with the visual conditions. We're just making a visual approach, just using the VOR as a reference. So we've already got Juba tuned up on uh, Nav 1 and Nav 2, 113.1. The course inbound 313, 
The aerodrome duration 1496, so we've got about 8,500 feet to lose there in terms of altitude. And lastly, in terms of the decision height, we're looking at 504 feet, so we can set that there up on the PFD. That's going to take quite some time to cycle through here, and we are now, as I say, at our top descent point. So I'll take out the autopilot, we'll fly the approach manually. We can start reducing our power setting here as well, put the aircraft into a descent. And now the aircraft very right wing heavy there as the power comes off. So we'll just maintain heading for now until we start to see that CDI bar come in. And initially we can turn down to 5,000 feet, the MSA at Juba 4,800. There's 504 for the DH. And it doesn't look like yet we're going to be visual with the field, but you can see the river there leads inbound towards Juba, just out to the east of the town. So we could actually visually just track the river in there towards the airfield. But just for the sake of testing out the CGI bar a little bit further here, we'll continue now on our heading for the VOR approach. I did notice in the notes for the scenery that we'll be using that apparently most of Juba's navigation aids are now out of action, so I'm not entirely sure whether or not realistically we would be picking up the VOR. Continue climb initially 210, crossing 1000, left direct to corner ATG up and uh, 46. Anyway, as we carry out the descent here, running through our descent checks. So the anti ice systems are set as required. Prop sync will take off, and we can guard that up once again. Pressurization settings were checked just before top of descent. Decision height is set, and the parking brake is off. That's our descent checklist complete. So the C-160 really relies quite heavily on having some sort of trim in, whether that's aileron trim, rudder trim, or a combination of the two. Again, without those, hand flying are not particularly enjoyable. We're back at neutral trim again now, and the aircraft very right wing heavy here. I'm just going to keep coming back off that power as well, keep the aircraft descending. Through 8,000 feet, so we've got about another 5,500 to lose, and about 80 miles to run. So not looking too bad here in terms of profile, but we'll just increase that rate of descent. And looks as well like the CDI bar there just starting to come in. Current ground speed 200 knots, so a descent rate of around 1000 feet per minute should do us quite nicely. And we can just start gently coming around as well now onto a heading inbound towards the field as the CDI bar comes in. We won't bother setting the heading bug, we'll just wait until we're on heading, we can centre that up. It, again, it's very fiddly there on the click spots, as far as the heading bug goes. Just going to use some aileron trim here again, to save me having to constantly fight the roll tendency of the aircraft. So for takeoff, really about three units out to the right seems appropriate. Generally at cruise power settings, neutral aileron is pretty reasonable. And it looks like here at low power settings we need a bit of left data on, about two or three units there. Again, I suspect overall that's probably more than is really needed on the aircraft. We'll come back up on the power, we can start reducing that descent rate. Again, we'll just level off at 5000 initially, we'll descend on the VOR approach. So vertical speed of around 500 feet per minute there should do us now. In terms of our speeds, we can take the gear anywhere below 281 knots, so we're pretty flexible there. And full flap, according to the manual, below 130. It doesn't mention, I don't think, any of the other stages of flap, so we'll just go with around flaps 20 initially, and then we'll take all flaps below 130 knots. 
So, centering up that heading bug. And showing 11 miles now to run. Not currently visual with the runway, but we'll keep the aircraft coming down. There's 10 miles. We'll start reducing our speed. Looks like we've probably got the runway just off the nose. Probably quite tricky to make out in the video. A little bit high here, currently 5,000 feet, 10 miles. Scenery in this part of the world, not the best to be fair. Had some cracking flights in the sim recently, but this in terms of the scenery hasn't been one of them, unfortunately. So the approach itself commences at 3,200. We're within range there now to descend down to 3,200. And we can level off there and recommence the descent at 6.2 miles, should we wish. 4,000 feet, so about another 2,500 feet to lose. Established now on the CDI bar, seven miles to run. Again, quite tricky to make out, but I believe Juba's just off the nose. I think you can see the runway track out towards the northwest. Within six miles now of the field, so we'll take the gear down. Let that speed keep reducing. Okay, flaps 20. We'll take the landing lights on. And sure enough, it is the runway off the nose. So we'll just continue the approach visually. The approach checks the flaps. Just holding there at 20 for now. Gear is down and checked. Landing lights are on, fuel pumps are on, air conditioning bleed valves are selected off. Holding 140 knots for now. And again we can take full flat blow 130. Once more the aircraft, reasonable to hand fly so long as you've got that trim in. Fairly enjoyable to fly overall, I would say. Minus the uh, trim issues. And it may be true to life for the C-160, perhaps the aircraft does need a lot of trim, but I've never really come across an aircraft that needed that much aileron trim input. Albeit I've never flown a uh, heavy turboprop. Blow 130 knots now. There's full flaps. And we have full flaps indicated, so landing check is complete. A little bit high here on the Pappy. And again, really needing the aid on trim there. True decision, we'll continue. We'll hold the speed around 110 knots. And just coming back onto profile. Off the power, I guess we don't want to flare too much with the gear configuration. Let's touch down. Pretty poor touchdown sounds there overall, unfortunately, just the default sounds. Not really appropriate for this sort of aircraft. So all the way up on the props into the beat range, we'll just let those do the work for now off the brakes. And we can roll through to the next exit, down at the end, on our left.
Okay, so we're just approaching the main apron here at Juba, just vacated the runway. So the condition levers can come back to the low idle detent. And they're set. Landing lights can come off. Taxi light is selected on. And I'm running through the offline checks. Anti-I systems are off. We'll take the window heats off. And same for the pro heats and the AOA heat. Flaps can come up. Now we'll just wait for those to run in. So flaps are up, spoilers are retracted, trims are set to neutral. The front fuel pumps can come off. Just come onto the brakes here, get the aircraft slowed down slightly. We're going to be making the turn out to the right fairly shortly. So front fuel pumps are selected off and the yellow hydraulic pump is off. That's the offline check is complete. So onto the brakes, we'll be making the next right turn onto the apron. And just as we come onto the bay here as well, taxi light can go off. So getting the aircraft nice and slow here in preparation for the stop. No marshal at four is here today. Onto the brakes, part brake is set. Running through the shutdown checks, which I'm fairly sure are pretty simplified here, but the air conditioning bleed air valves are selected off, parking brake is set on, taxi light is off, engine vibration monitoring is selected off, fuel pumps, interestingly the fuel pumps come off there before the engines are shut down, but the fuel pumps are selected off, condition levers can come through to cut off, so we'll shut the number one first, actually just before we do that we'll crack the window again. So, cut off there on the number one. We'll just watch the engine run down. Again, nice sounds overall when the engines are back at idle power. And a pretty decent rundown animation. So, good cut there on number one. We'll do the same on number two. Good rundown there on number two. Anti collision light is off. Master warning there, so we'll just cancel that. The hydraulic pressure, expecting to see that of course with the engines running down. One thing I'm surprised we didn't see there in the checklist ahead of time, we could have started up the APU before shutting down the engines. So APU air inlet set open, we'll start the APU up once again. That's just running up. Prop brakes as required, not needed today. We'll take the avionics off. So weather radar can go off. FMSs. You should have to hold the button down there for the shutdown. So both shut down. APU is now available. That can go back onto the bus. And once again we'll select the transfer switches. Engine generators can come off. And we have a good shutdown here on the bay in Juba. So there you go guys, I do hope you enjoyed our outing in the Azure Poly Transall C160. The aircraft is definitely another nice effort from Azure Poly overall. Still a work in progress I would say, and that is quite apparent from certain areas of the aircraft. We saw the same though with the Fuga Magister. So Azure Poly definitely a dev that likes to put in the work after their releases, keep improving the product. And actually, in many respects now, the CM170 is one of the most feature-complete products within the sim. Azure Poly are also quite clear about the fact that the aircraft is still a work in progress. They state there are still many areas that they're hoping to work on as the product develops. And certainly, as you'll have hopefully seen in the video, there's already a very solid foundation there, the product already done to the sort of standard you see from many other fully-fledged products. 
Anyway, as usual, just to finish up the review, we'll run through a few points regarding what I think of the C160. And again, most of my negative points throughout this conclusion really just coming down to the fact that certain areas of the aircraft are not yet complete. On that note then, starting with the aircraft systems, definitely still work to be done there overall. To be clear, the systems fidelity of the product already pretty decent, certainly above average within the sim. But noticeably, there are still entire sections of the aircraft systems that yet to be really modelled. For example, we already touched on the onboard FMSs having very limited functionality currently. The same goes with the EHSI, no real mode selections currently available there. Similarly, the ventilation system, the fuel tankering system, both areas that still need some work, although in fairness the latter is really more of a sim limitation. But again, for me, in summary, the system's fidelity already above average within the sim. There's certainly enough there already to enjoy the Transal. It would certainly be great though, if we see Azure Poly, as they have promised to do, fleshing out the aircraft systems along the way. And the same goes with the aircraft sounds really. Fairly decent overall, there are some areas better than others. As far as the engine sounds go, I think they're really nice during the startup. They sound pretty great on the ground. Not particularly good during the takeoff, the cruise sounds are acceptable. And as far as the secondary sounds go, nice in some areas, for example the master warning sound is great, some of the systems control sounds very good as well. But again there are still controls that are missing sounds, and as well some of the default sounds creeping in quite noticeably there. For example during the touchdown the default sounds just sound totally inappropriate for the aircraft. I'm not sure how much Azure Poly will be able to do to improve the engine sounds, but certainly in terms of the cockpit sounds, again, I would expect them to improve those as the product moves along. The flight model of the aircraft was fairly nice overall, it felt broadly appropriate. I'm not sure how true to life the performance is versus the real numbers, but generally speaking to fly it felt fairly authentic. I do think though that currently the trim inputs required seem to be overdone. I can certainly imagine a little bit of aileron trim, rudder trim being needed here and there, but not the amount of input we were having to make to keep the aircraft straight and level. And as I mentioned during the flight, those trim issues do ever so slightly detract from the enjoyment of flying the aircraft, but once you have the C160 trimmed out, a pretty enjoyable aircraft to fly overall. The default viewpoints within the aircraft are certainly another area that still needs work. Not an area that I typically touch upon during reviews, usually I find every product has at least one half decent pilot view, but with the Transal, currently there's actually no default pilot seating position, which seems a little bit strange. When you load into the cockpit, you'll actually find yourself sat at the back of the flight deck, which is a nice view, but pretty useless for actually flying the aircraft. On that note as well, once I got myself set up with a viewpoint that I was happy with, I also found that the default view level gave somewhat of a fisheye effect, so having to zoom in a little bit there as well. Lastly, in terms of the documentation, which can be downloaded directly from the Azure Poly website, Actually, the manual was very nice overall. It had a lot of detail regarding the aircraft systems, for example, a full set of checklists. And also the manual was quite clear as to which areas of the product are not currently complete, which areas will be considered for further work in the future. So I would suggest that it's well worth downloading the manual ahead of time, getting a feel for the product before you purchase, see whether or not you're happy with what's available. My only real gripe with the manual would be that there was very little detail offered as to how to actually fly the aircraft. Basic limitations and speeds were offered up, but other than that, as you can probably tell from the video, I was left guessing somewhat as to how to operate the Transal. In terms of the aircraft's FPS, you will take a little bit of a hit with the C160. I was getting around 59 FPS in the aircraft versus around 95 FPS with the default Cessna 152. Moving on to what I like about the Transal, starting with the visuals. I think the external visual modelling and indeed texturing is very nicely done. The aircraft looks very realistic overall. The PBR rendering looks very good and there's also a very decent selection of liveries available, pretty much covering the entirety of Transal operations. Internally I also think the aircraft looks very nice, certainly the modelling is done to a very high standard once again. Texturing in certain areas I do feel falls slightly short of the external model. Certainly the main instrument panel itself, the pedestal, very nicely textured, very nicely weathered as well. But certain areas of the cockpit, to my mind at least, looking a little bit clean. And again, some of the texturing just not quite as crisp, quite as sharp as I would like it. The system's fidelity we have already touched on, there's certainly still work to be done there, but I like the complexity of the aircraft overall. What has been modelled seems to have been modelled pretty well, there were one or two bugs which obviously need fixing up. For example, the fuel used indicators there, freezing during the flight. But once more, if Azure Poly continue to put in as much effort with the Transal as they did with the Magister after release, I'm sure we'll see the C160 continue to develop in complexity, and it's certainly a very interesting aircraft to operate overall, 
with it being a big heavy turboprop and a slightly unusual systems architecture versus a more modern aircraft. On the subject of the aircraft being a turboprop, at this stage in time I wouldn't expect anything more complex than you'll see from a typical turboprop within the sim. And going off the overall fidelity of other Azure Poly products, I wouldn't necessarily expect that to change, so keep your expectations accordingly there. Definitely a few positive points as well worth mentioning with the sounds. Again, I think the engines sound excellent during the startup, very nice overall on the ground. And as mentioned just a moment ago, the sounds that are already included there in the cockpit are very nice. So hopefully Azure Poly can continue to flesh out the cockpit sounds and maybe do some tweaking as well just to make those takeoff sounds a little bit more impressive. Overall the aircraft comes with a very nice feature set. You'll have noticed during the external shots we have the usual chocks, ground power unit, covers for the aircraft. As well as that we have functioning doors and windows, an operable ramp, a little bit of a party trick as well of the C-160. You can actually raise and lower the entire fuselage of the aircraft for loading. And indeed, Azure Poly have gone to the efforts of modelling that as well. Other additions include visible onboard cargo. You can have typical supplies as we saw here today, or indeed military vehicles. A rudimentary flare system is also visually modelled. Hopefully you saw that during the introduction. There's also custom prop effects, dust effects as well off the prop. And an onboard tablet which allows you to select all of these various features, as well as loading the aircraft, loading the fuel. So in short, as I say, the Transall really does come with a very complete and comprehensive set of features. In summary then, I do think that the Transall C160 is another very nice effort from Azure Poly. Clearly there is still work to be done, nothing I would say though that really compromises one's enjoyment of the aircraft in its current state. So if you do go ahead and decide to purchase now, I think you'll be pretty happy with the product overall. However, if you do want a more complete product, then it may well pay to wait a couple of months and see what Azure Poly can achieve. That just about concludes for the video here today. Once again, I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. If you want to help support the channel and gain early access to a number of videos, you can do so by becoming either a channel member or patron. And on that note, as ever, a very big thank you to my channel members and patrons for all of your support. I do hope that all of you are having a great day wherever you are. Take really good care and I will see you all again soon.